He's uh, currently the webmaster for the uh, Institute's website, Mises.org. He's adjunct scholar at the Mackinac Center in Public Policy. Also teaches for Acton, teaches for Fee, teaches for us. Frequent writer for Mises.org. Wrote the most popular article ever to appear on the website. It's written frequently for LewRockwell.com. Writes a column for probably your favorite newspaper, The Wanderer. <laughs> he is the author of Sing Like a Catholic. But he has a new book with a very whimsical title, Bourbon for Breakfast, <laughs> Living Outside the Statist Quo. I am embarrassed that UPS has left that box somewhere and it didn't arrive. But anyone who wants to buy that book at a, a price of $20, Jeffrey will sign them and we will ship them to you. If you sign up today and pay for them, we'd love to uh, have you have the opportunity to buy them. Uh, there is much wisdom in this book. He is the, the man who really makes the world go around at the Mises Institute. And today, he's talking about how government is unraveling civilization by force. Please help me welcome Jeffrey A. Tucker. Thank you so much, Doug. I'm just gonna put my glass of bourbon here. I didn't quite get enough <laughs> for breakfast, so I'll have it for lunch. Uh, how many people here know what the Wanderer is? The Wanderer, oh, a funny, a oh, Catholic table over there, I see, okay. I don't write about economics for the Wanderer, I write about, about music. So you read the column? Do you, you don't actually read the Wanderer, you just know about it, okay, yeah. yeah I understand, I understand. Everybody who reads The Wonder is over 80, as far as I can tell. It's... So I'm very grateful to Dr. Cochran for putting this wonderful chart in your handout. Um, this is the chart that shows wealth in England from 1100 up until the Industrial Revolution to the present. So I love these kinds of charts. Uh, because they help us think outside of our own times and our own generation and think more broadly, which is very difficult to do. Um, I have children, and one of the things that I was astonished to discover about children is it's almost impossible to pass on knowledge to them. Um, have you noticed this? <laughs> it's, it's very strange. You know, you, you think there ought to be some kind of software or something? There's a developer over here, a couple of software developers, that I could just download all my experiences and knowledges to her head, you know, and, and she could carry it around with so she wouldn't have to go through all the troubles I've gone through. And, um, and so, how wonderful would that be if we, could, if we had such a system that we could just kind of um, download information to every new generation smarter than the previous one? Um, uh, sadly, for whatever reason, uh, the world wasn't constructed this way, um, so that we all have to keep learning every, every generation. As individuals, we keep having to learn, and we, can, we can't seem to learn from... Uh, we keep you know, just drawing on our own experiences of our own times. And it's really tragic from the point of view of economic understanding because we're not allowed to experience what it was like to be a peasant in 1150 you know, in, in London. I, I, I think that it's very likely that if we could do that, that uh, we wouldn't be bothering with a lot of the fallacies that are around today, most of which are taking for granted the world in which we live, this world of, of uh, astonishing amounts of wealth. Um, you can draw a similar chart like this for Europe and show actually that the increase in income came before uh, uh, 1750, 1776 is I think the date that, that Professor Cochran likes to talk about, but actually occurred 100 years earlier, or 150 years earlier. But the thing that the chart illustrates is the point that he was trying to make, that the default position of humanity in this world is miserable. It's really rotten. It's a state of hunter-gatherer 
society. You know, that, this is where we would be. And I, I think it would be interesting to actually to perform in your own mind an, a mental experiment. This is, you can try this with other people to discover the way they think about the world. Imagine that we take the whole world as it is right now and zap away all capital accumulation, all private wealth, and the division of labor across the world completely and imagine the kind of world you would end up with. And what you would end up with is the world that you see in this first part of the chart right here, um, which is income near zero, right? That, that's just a miserable lot. And by the way, that's far better than people were in the ancient world, you know? I mean, this is actually progress here, but we would be back to this state right here. And imagine now you have this, this state of humanity, uh, and by the way, there were something like 500 million people alive, and you just have to kind of hope that you were among them. Um, uh, and try to figure out, well, now superimpose upon, on top of that system of the world that we have, um, all of the existing governmental structures that are with us today. Right? So you can give uh, this year 1100 a TSA, for example, a, a Federal Reserve, a Consumer Product Safety Commission, a Department of Labor, uh, Barack Obama, I mean, and, and, and transplant the whole apparatus of the state that we have right now on top of this year 1100, and what would happen? How, how much wealthier would people become as a result of this superimposition of the total state, you know, on top of, and I think the answer that I would give is they wouldn't be wealthier at all. They wouldn't be any better off um, and would probably be made even worse off. There's nothing that the state can do to eliminate the poverty that is the default position of humanity. It is only private enterprise that can dig us out of this catastrophe of the state of nature. It's only private enterprise. You understand this is a reversal of the view of Thomas Hobbes, right? I mean, Thomas Hobbes had this view that without the state, there would be, um, our lives would be short and, and um, we'd be fighting each other and miserable and the state comes along and somehow fixes us up. Well, this is just fantasy, really. I mean, it's a, the exact opposite is the truth. In fact, the only thing that can get us out of a state of nature is private enterprise. So if you understand that, and I think we would understand that if we could, if we could somehow download all human experiences into our head, I think we would understand it very easily. We would understand a lot about economics and wouldn't have these endless debates that we have right now. And yet, if you tour Washington, D.C., and you come along the, uh, the building uh, for the Internal Revenue Service and look up at its facade, you'll see a quotation emblazoned up there from Oliver Wendell Holmes that says, taxes are the price we pay for a civilized society. Right? <laughs> this, is, this is the message that we are given when we tour Washington. Uh, the logical culmination of this view is, of course, the, the total state. I mean, after all, if, it's, if, the, if, if taxes are the price we pay for the civilized society, the more taxes we pay, the more civilized we become, you know? And this is, this is more or less the early theory of the socialists, um, which is hard to remember now, uh, but Dr. Cochran is right. You know, the, the scientific socialism of Marx and his generation uh, really was about the goal of improving society. This is the belief that they looked around at the world of England and Europe and said, look, the, lots of people are getting rich, but a lot of other people are getting poorer all the time. So M Marx in his, in his Communist Manifesto said, the modern laborer, instead of rising with the process of industry, sinks deeper and deeper below the conditions of existence of his own class. He becomes a pauper, and pauperism develops more rapidly than population and wealth. So this is an empirical pos position. It's a prediction that's easily subject to investigation. Um, and his prescription was socialism, which he believed was going to make us all better off. And Marx wrote that under socialism, the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. 
Now, um, Dr. Maltsev, Yuri Maltsev is here with us, and he's going to be giving, I think, a wonderful talk along these lines and discuss a little bit about whether or not socialism really did accomplish this and his experience and in, in world history. So I won't go there. But I do just want to emphasize the point that early socialist theory was the goal of it was to improve the lot of humanity to get us out of the state of nature. There was a fundamental belief in material progress in the early socialist theory. It was hard for us to remember this today. You know, um, I, I was looking this up and trying to document in my own mind that socialists used to believe that it would be a good thing to see material progress for all of humanity. And I ran across Lenin's great slogan, slogan that he used when he was the ruler of the newly created Soviet Union, when he was asked what communism was, he said, well, look, it's, it's easy to sum up what communism is. Communism is Soviet power plus the electrification of the whole country. <laughs> electrification, right? That was the idea. Um, and it was true, the whole, the whole uh, left-wing establishment at the time believed very strongly in um, what we might call a, a kind of national greatness, you know, a belief in the, in the material progress of humanity. You know, some years ago, there's this publication called The Weekly Standard, which is a, a kind of a conservative publication. I don't, I don't know, I, does it still exist, Tom? The Weekly Standard, does it still exist? Okay, yeah. Yeah, ever since the advent of digital media, one never knows anymore. So apparently there's still this publication called Weekly Standard, I don't know. But, and so they had this idea that, look, conservatism's become really boring, you know, it's, um, we've lost the vision. Um, what we need is a, a new kind of conservatism called national greatness conservatism. You know, we need to get back to this idea of, of doing huge things as a nation, massive, big projects, you know, that, are, that inspire us, like, um, uh, I don't know, like making Mount Rushmore, you know, it's an inspiring thing, or the Hoover Dam, look how inspiring that is. And, and going to the moon and, and uh, having a big war, you know, these are the kinds of things that the conservatism needs to be about, you know. Uh, it's a funny thing because, because this national greatness conservatism, as they called it, David Brooks, I think he writes for the New York Times now, right? Um, so, but you know, this was not a conservative view at all, actually. It was taken over from the left. This is what the left used to believe, that that they would use the state to build up the nation, to make us ever richer, to make us more materially uh, prosperous. So uh, how does it happen that the conservatives would take over this line of thinking? Well, it turns out that the left completely abandoned it sometime in the 1950s um, when uh, left-wing socialist theory turned on a dime. And this is what I would like to talk about today. Um, so looking back and even the American experience, you know, the progressive era, uh, the theory behind the progressive era was that they would uh, create all kinds of government institutions that would uplift us materially and make us richer. That was what the Fed was supposed to do. Uh, that's what all the institutions were designed to do. Um, suddenly in the 1950s, everything began to change. Um, Murray Rothbard is discussing, discusses this whole shift of, of a socialist theory and fingers that the critical book here is John Kenneth Galbraith's book called The Affluent Society. It came out in 1958, where we see a complete change in the nature of the socialist critique of capitalism. Instead of claiming that capitalism was leaving, leading to ever greater pauperization and impoverishment of the working class, which it obviously was not, Right? I mean, capitalism was making everybody richer. It was imp an implausible claim at some point, you know. So um, uh, he changed everything completely. He said, you know, the problem with capitalism is very different, you know. Uh, the problem is that it makes us too uh, consumerist uh, in, in thinking. It makes us too materialist. In fact, our problem is that we have not uh, too little wealth, but far too much wealth, and it's leading to a sort of middle-class decadence. And uh, this ever-increasing wealth under, under capitalism is, is crushing us uh, and impoverishing us in ways we don't entirely understand. Okay, this was, this is Galbraith's claim. And, and he said uh, that the rising wealth of the private sector was coming at the expense of the wealth of the public sector. And the public sector is really the measure that we ought to be using to decide whether or not we're a better off as a society or not. So this is an, a completely new way of looking at 
um, the problem with capitalism from the, from the point of view of the socialist left. Um, in today's terminology, it's called the first, this is what the left, left calls it, the first post-materialist book. So now we're supposed to be post-materialist, you know, and enact policies that, that help us to get there more quickly, which they are, in fact, having a great deal of luck in doing. Um, there have been 10,000 books along the lines of uh, Galbraith's affluent society since then. And uh, I like what Lou Rockwell has written about this. He said, it's as if the socialists discovered that their plan creates poverty, so they decided to change their name to environmentalists to make poverty the goal. Yes. <laughs> The, the term sustainability here is, is an interesting one. I get, it came around, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago or something, this term sustainability, which is really just a synonym for, for socialism that, that aspires to impoverish everybody and, and make us happy about having done so. So um, it's very strange. And ultimately, really, it comes down to sustainability comes back to reducing uh, the advances of civilization by force. And by civilization, I'm really talking about a series of very small things. It comes down to whether or not, um, you know, our houses are clean and free of disease, whether we have uh, good ways of disposing of our trash, whether we have uh, uh, indoor plumbing and it works well, whether we have dance troops and, and uh, local symphonies and opportunities for our children, whether or not uh, our churches can be well-funded but through private wealth. These are the, this, is, this is what civilization is all about. It's not about Mount Rushmore, all right? That's not civilization. It's about the small things that make our lives uh, more beautiful, cleaner, uh, and make life more uh, worth living, really, ultimately. And this is what I would argue sustainability is, is, is attacking at its very core. So I just kind of went through a list of books that I could uh, come up with on Amazon. If you look up the word sustainability on Amazon, you come up with some amazing things. So just a few titles. Sustainability by Design, a subversive strategy for transforming our consumer culture. Okay. Sustainability Indicators, Measuring the Immeasurable. Yeah, indeed. Re return to st sustainability. 147 tips for teaching sustainability. Returning to sustainability, by the way, means returning to this part of the graph. Right? Um, Living Green, a practical guide for simple sustainability. The Bridge to the Edge of the World, Capitalism, the Environment, and Crossing from Crisis to Sustainability. Sustainability, an amazing picture of what life would would will soon be like. Uh, permaculture, principles and pathways beyond sustainability, future scenarios, how communities can adapt to peak oil and climate change. Okay, the author of these last two, his name is David Holmgren, Holmgren, and he's in Australia. So, and uh, you can look up his name and find that he has done many interviews on YouTube, okay? So you can, you can watch these interviews, and they're very interesting. He's a very fascinating guy and very nice sort of fellow. I'm sure if we met him here for cocktails, we would like him very much. But he insists that his interviews take place out, outdoors, since that's, you know, the, the great place to be, because you've got bird sounds and nature scenes behind you. So he's outdoors, and he's got this Australian accent. And um, he has this kind of way of speaking, these kind of spaghetti-like prose, and he kind of goes on and rambles, you know, at great length. And it's kind of captivating. I watched him for a full hour. Ha, huh, I regret it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but he's, he's speaking. And, you know, he casually just toss, tosses off. Uh, the interview says, well, how long do you suppose... By the way, his whole theory is that we're running out of oil, and that's just um, a fact. And it's part of a central doctrine that he has, you know, and nobody is permitted to question this. He doesn't even feel like he needs to argue it, you know. Um, oil's going away, that's one thing that's terrible that's happening, you know, and there's just nothing that can be done about it. And also, um, the, the, the globe is burning up. You know, it's kind of like getting hotter and hotter because we're all driving our cars around and using oil and doing industrial sort of things, decadent consumerist sort of things, going to Walmart and that sort of thing. It's causing the world to heat up. <laughs> And the world's getting on fire, you know, and we're running out of oil, and, and then suddenly everything's going to collapse. Okay, that's, that's his view. And so the interviewer asks, she says, the interviewer says, well, how long do you suppose we've been on the wrong track in this regard? He says, well, I think it's been about, I've thought about this, I think it's about 500 years we've been on the wrong track. And then the interviewer says, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> 
crazy. Um, but as I began to think about this point of view, I thought of all the people, my fellow shoppers at a, rest at a grocery store in Auburn we have now called Earth Fair, which promises to sell you only organic stuff, you know, fashionably organic stuff at very high prices, by the way. Um, <laughs> And I wondered how many of my fellow shoppers would agree with Mr. Holmgren here. And I decided there would probably be just nearly about 100%. You know, if you go up to people, you know, who are buying their ear candles and uh, granola bars. Um, how long, do you suppose we've been on the wrong track technologically about, about 500 years? They'd say, yeah, you know, I think that's about right. Yeah, about 500 years. Yeah. So he's going on. And he says, uh, so the lady, <laughs> she says, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do in the future about suburbia? He said, you know, I, I'm not pessimistic about suburbia at all. Um, you know, if you think about suburbia, it's got lots of asphalt. And that's great in some ways for collecting rainwater for us to drink. And, you know, well, the other thing about suburbia is we have backyards. And backyards are great also for growing our food. So we can use them for that purpose. And uh, another thing that you find in suburbia is you find garages. And of course, in the future, our cars, they won't be worth anything because of course there won't be any gasoline. So nobody will be driving. So what can we do with our garage? Well, we can make things. We can make crafts and benches and chairs. And it'll be a beautiful thing <laughs> that we'll be making our crafts and our garages and drinking rainwater from the asphalt. <laughs> and pulling carrots out of the ground in our backyards. And so I'm not pessimistic at all. This is a very beautiful vision of the future. <laughs> so the problem here, <laughs> so uh, the, the problem is 500 years ago, there were 500 million people living on the earth. Today there's seven billion. We've got to find something to do with the difference. <laughs> Some place to put them, store them, stack their bodies. <laughs> and it's very likely that in the world that Holmgren imagines that there won't be um, micro digital devices like this in which I can watch his YouTubes. Um, it's very likely and it's also unlikely I won't be able to press a button to order his book, you know, to come to my house by truck. So I, I do consider that perhaps there is one benefit from his bit of vision that he won't be a best-selling author anymore. <laughs> this is hardly an unusual view. Today we're told constantly that we need to slow down production, take away conveniences and and this will all make us more virtuous because it will lower our standard of living. We're, we're constantly being told to cut back, to consume less, buy locally, go green, carpool, recycle, save, stop indulging. And to this end, consumer products are constantly being banned every day. We have ever fewer choices in the area of medicine and chemicals and food and drink and otherwise in every aspect of our life, sector after sector, this is going on. And all of this, I submit, really amounts to a regression of everything we know of as civilization and all that we associate with living better, healthier, smarter, more pro prosperous and more cultured lives. And the heck of it is that it's being done by design, by purpose, this is the, this is the goal. And I would like to just um, in the time I have, go through a series of examples here. Doug, how much time do I have? Well, yeah. okay, I'll just kind of go on. Remaining? Light bulbs. The government's banned incandescent light bulbs. In a few years, you won't be able to get them anymore, and we're being told we must use fluorescent bulbs. Because fluorescent bulbs use less energy, they give just as good a light, really. And so we need to be told to do this. We need to be, we need to be forced to upgrade. Um, well, this is already happening. The last factory that made light bulbs of an incandescent nature it just closed down last week. 
Um, and in the future, we'll all be buying fluorescent. It may not seem like much, right? I don't know. I, I can't stand uh, uh, fl fluorescent lighting. My daughter loves it, you know, but whatever. It should be a choice of the individual. Last year, I tried to buy some lights for their Christmas tree. Have you ever tried to use fluorescent lights on your Christmas tree? <laughs> Uh, they say it's the same light. It's not the same light. Okay, the tree did not look lit up at all. It looked sort of vaguely speckled. <laughs> it was the strangest thing I've ever seen. So much for Christmas. You know, they've taken it away from me. All right. All right. Um, I do want to mention the problem of bed bugs. Um, are you keeping up with this? It's an astonishing thing. Okay, so this country right now we have a bed bug epidemic. It's going on all over the country. The, the offices of Google in New York are now infested. The offices of CNN are now infested. Yeah, maybe they'll come around on the DDT question after all, you know, at CNN. But um, this is a remarkable thing. You know, bed bugs have been wiped out off the whole planet uh, about 50 years ago. They were gone, thanks to DDT, invented by a, a brilliant private uh, 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 chemist uh, working for a private Swiss company and uh, saved untold millions of lives uh, when he got the Nobel Prize for it. DDT is a, a magnificent pro-civilization um, chemical, and it was banned thanks to a fraudulent book by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. Uh, uh, just a garbage piece of book, and it persuaded the governments of the world to eliminate DDT, thereby causing you know, some, something on the order of 200 million deaths. You know, even today, between one and three uh, million uh, people in Africa die every year due to malaria because of the absence of DDT, okay? So we, and, and we don't spray it anymore in this country. And look, what we've got a, a, a unbelievable, we've got a bed bug problem. Now people say, no, bed bugs, They're, you know, they actually don't cause any diseases, you know, they don't transmit diseases. Well, you know, there's just something terrifying about the idea that you would lie down in your bed and these bugs would come up from your mattress and seize on your back. And they've got this chemical inside them. And they put you to sleep. You know, they don't, so you can't know that they're there. They're kind of like dead in your skin. And then they suck your blood all night. And, and if you get enough bed bugs on you, it can, you can lead to massive blood loss. Okay? But even if you don't have massive blood loss, it's difficult to get to sleep at all. If you imagine that the second you close your eyes, the bugs are going to come out and seize on you and, and suck your blood. And there are cases where people just live in terror, uh, fear of bed bugs. They run out into the street screaming, ah, I can't stand it anymore. Just the very thought of bed bugs, all right? So we got to get rid of bug bugs. We can't get rid of bed bugs because all the chemicals that kill these things are banned today especially for indoor use. DDT, certainly. There's another chemical called uh, Propoxor. It's permitted by the EPA to be used outdoors, but not indoors. So we can't get rid of these things. The Ohio Department of Health has pleaded with the EPA to let them use this chemical. Uh-uh, can't use it. You gotta live with the bed bugs. The stuff is spreading. The bugs are, in our times, we're dealing with bed bugs. Why? Because the market's been subverted. When I say the market, what I mean is not that you know, DDT is the magic prescription for all things. And if, you know, maybe, maybe there's some other chemical. The point is, uh, and some people say actually that many bed bugs are, are now uh, immune, and mosquitoes too, immune to DDT. That may, may well be true. I don't actually know, and I'm not actually advocating some kind of mass DDT spray. And what I'm saying is that these government interventions have subverted our capacity to civilize our world. And that if you had a legitimate market working where we could try these chemicals out on a trial and error basis, we could actually compete with, with, with insects. Insects are the only known thing on this planet that have killed more people than governments. You realize this, right? <laughs> more people die from insects than gulags, gas chambers, you know, insects. We must kill them if we're gonna have civilization. All right, they won't let us. Now, uh, the EPA recommends, uh, look, you got a bed bug problem, not a problem. Just use hot water. I'll use hot water. I'm going to pour hot water in my mattress, okay? <laughs> but, there, you know, there's a funny problem about the hot water issue. They don't let us have hot water anymore. You know that the government mandates require that hot water heaters are shipped with a, a, a fixed low temperature. So that's why when you turn on your, your water, it's sort of vaguely tepid. You're like, where's my hot water? You keep turning it and turning it and turning it. It's just sort of, it's not quite hot. You have to go in there and hack your, your, your uh, water heater in order to get hot water anymore, you know? This is, again, an EPA regulation. This is catastrophic. It means our clothes aren't getting clean. 
And, and so your sheets have bed bugs in them. You can't get them out even by washing them, and so on. I mean, I could go through the list of examples. Um, we've got ever-increasing limits on, on trash pickup in our house. We've got mandatory recycling, which is just beyond belief. The idea that in this day and age, we'd have to be sorting our hands through our dirty trash and separating, oh, there's plastic, there's a soiled uh, a towel, here's an unsoiled you know, towel, you know, and separating them all out into all these various areas. This is radically uncivilized um, and is super unsanitary. Since the beginning of time, we've been dealing with the problem of diseases being spread by trash. You know, uh, this is something that uh, pri the private sector and, uh, and capitalism actually fixed and accomplished, we got rid of the problem of trash, which is, you know, trash combined with, with insects killed off about two thirds of Europe's population, you know, in the Middle Ages. Uh, this is serious business, trash, trash disposal, but we turn it over to government, they limit the amount of trash we can make, they limit how often they pick it up, then they mandate that we stick our hands in and recycle it all the time. It's a terrible mess, this is decivilizing. The attack on plumbing is an intolerable situation. Our toilets no longer work. Our water pressure is absurdly low. Our shower heads now have to be uh, uh, hacked with drills in order to make them work properly. <laughs> a few years ago, I highlighted a company that was getting around government rules shipping shower heads that actually worked. I said, look, this is a wonderful company. Well, the company wrote me and said, oh, would you mind uh, taking our name off your article, and especially the link, because we've gotten calls from, from the federal government wanting to go after our shower heads. Folks, this is being seriously enforced. It's not a joke. They're going after shower head companies that sell you shower heads at work. Okay? <laughs> Other examples? Sudafedrin, all right? Many of us use Sudafed to get through the difficult months of the year. There is a woman now... Um, languishing in jail in my own hometown for having bought too much set of pseudofedrin, uh, something like uh, 12 packs over the course of four, uh, over four weeks. A bush banned the stuff for free distribution. Now you have to use your license and it's rationed, all right? This is a civilizing drug. It helps many, many people. Clears it, makes, makes it possible to live without a stuffy nose, all right? This woman in my own community has now been fa is faced with 20 years in jail for buying too much Sudafed, a, a, a drug that you could buy only five years ago in unlimited quantities, right? These things are happening every day to us. Mandatory decivilization. The attack on cars, intolerable. The appalling subsidization of this preposterous thing called the electric car. The um, the uh, which if you want to buy an electric car that's fine with me but you know you shouldn't you shouldn't it shouldn't be done with government planning and uh, and mandates. The attack on energy, oil, and can you believe the hysteria that was brought about uh, over this oil leak that occurred in the Gulf uh, not too many months ago with BP, which was treated as like some sort of terrorist organization, as if, as if they wanted to just you know, spill oil all over the oceans and that there was absolutely no loss to them whatsoever. Um, the hysteria was beyond belief. Uh, we struggle for all of, all, of, all of human history to come up with decent forms of energy, and uh, when we got them, we treat them as if uh, they're dispensable. The attack on the internet is growing by the day in the name of intellectual property. We have now, for the first time in history, an opportunity to put online a, a universally available library of all known things, all books that have ever been printed. And what has stopped it? Government regulators. Google wanted to do this with its Google Book program. Many people were cooperating. The government is preventing it through the enforcement of of intellectual property rules combined working with a, a, a private industry to enforce what is in effect a government regulation. So we can begin to see a pattern here. Government planning was never a good means to do anything, but at least there was a time when at least government planning set out to bring progress to humanity. It was the wrong means to achieve what I regard as the right goal. Today, government planning is working as maliciously as possible and effectively as possible as a means to achieve the wrong goal, which is the decivilization of society. I mean by this that if there is anything that government is actually good at doing, it is at destroying things. Even so, in seeking to reduce our standard of living and drive us backwards in the progress of civilization, the government is really playing with fire, unleashing evils that are unknown to us even today. 
Never forget that it was not government, but freedom that gave us civilization. Freedom gave us the rise, gave, gave rise to innovation, the unleashing of human ingenuity that built cities, expanded the division of labor across the globe. It tripled the average lifespan. Freedom gave us universal distribution of food, medicine, music, learning, global communication at zero price. It gave us the modern miracles of the grocery store and fast food. I'm not shy to say it, I love it. <laughs> Freedom created the wealth that funds our churches, our centers of research, civic association, dance troops, symphonies, art museums, nature preserves. Freedom is what allows institutions like the Mises Institute to exist and experience vibrant growth. Only a free and wealthy society permits civilization to flourish for everyone. It was Joseph Schumpeter who said that the great tragedy of capitalism is that it produces riches so abundant that people tend to take them for granted, imagining that they can hobble and destroy its productive machinery without great economic and social consequence. This is precisely what is happening today. This tendency to romanticize poverty and simplicity and a world without modern technology is an ideology that is animating the antics of many of today's intellectuals, politicians, and bureaucrats who have set themselves up as enemies of all that makes life grand, of all that makes life worth living, which is to say they have set themselves up as enemies of freedom. Now, I began with an Oliver, Hindle, Oliver Wendell Holmes quotation, so I'll end with one. In a moment of good sense, he said, State interference is an evil where it cannot be shown to be a good. The libertarian tradition has shown that government intervention cannot be shown to be a good, ever, especially now. Our taxes are paying not for civilization, but rather for its destruction. In dramatic contrast, your support of the Mises Institute which is dedicated at its very core to defending the institutions that permit civilization to flourish, is helping to sustain what too many take for granted. So I'd like to thank you for your support. Thank you for being a friend of progress, freedom, and the well-being of all of humanity. <laughs>